Hello, welcome to part one of two of your lecture on psychopharmacology. In this lecture, we will discuss the principles of psychopharmacology and sites of drug action or the effects of drugs on uh, important neuromodulatory functions uh, of the brain. In terms of principles of psychopharmacology, we're going to talk about the kinetic aspects of that, how drug effectiveness is determined, what happens upon repeated administration of a drug or with the placebo effect, which you may recall from an earlier lecture in the semester. With regard to sites of drug action, we're also going to talk about neurotransmitters, their production, how they are stored and released, how they interact with receptors, and are either taken up or destroyed as a consequence of neurotransmission processes. We will also be discussing neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, specifically highlighting um, some mentioned in your textbook, uh, albeit more briefly than covered in the text, including acetylcholine, the monoamines, amino acids, peptides, lipids, and so on. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to describe the routes of administration of drugs and how they travel throughout the body, um, think about drug effectiveness, how particularly the effectiveness changes with repeated administration or in the context of placebo, describe the effects of drugs on synaptic activity, and we're going to talk about that towards the end of the lecture. Um, you're also going to have an opportunity to review the role of neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, and hopefully understand something about how they impact behavior through their effects on neurons. Before we really delve into psychopharmacology, I think we need to take a step back and start with the big picture through a little bit of review. You will recall that as a discipline, psychology spans many levels of analysis that run from biological to social influences and back again, basically in ways that are interconnected and cyclical. So psychopharmacology, um, which we will define shortly, fits into the bottom five or so levels. But as discussed in the lecture on addiction, um, i.e. part two of our discussion on psychopharmacology, it, and by it I mean psychopharmacology, has far reach into even the social level, um, particularly when it impacts social policy, criminal justice, and culture as a whole as evidenced by the opioid crisis. Hopefully you will recall this figure from your reading. Uh, the chart begins with pharmacology, the study of all drugs at the top, and branches into psychopharmacology, which is the study of drugs that affect the nervous system and behavior, and also all other drugs, the study of drugs that affect the nervous system and behavior. Um, psychopharmacology then branches into two uh, subdisciplines, drugs of abuse, examples including heroin, cocaine, things that are discussed in um, the part two lecture in much more detail, and also therapeutic drugs, examples including antidepressants, antipsychotics that are used to treat um, chronic depression and schizophrenia, for instance, um, and then a bunch of all other drugs that um, are exemplified by blood pressure medicines, antibiotics, um, things to treat, um, let's see, uh, acid reflux that are either uh, prescribed or uh, can be obtained over the counter. So there's a pretty big umbrella that is governed by pharmacology. Given that psychopharmacology is the study of effects of drugs on the nervous system and behavior, it's important that we know that there are two major aspects of drugs um, that lead to their influence on behavior. And we describe those two aspects as drug effects and sites of action. 
So the drug effect is the changes that the drug produces in an animal's physiological processes as well as behavior. The sites of action have to do with the locations where the molecules of drugs interact with molecules located on or in cells of the body, um, ultimately impacting the biochemical processes of the cells of the body um, or the brain. Pharmacokinetics is the process by which drugs are absorbed um, once they're taken into the body, distributed throughout the body, metabolized uh, within the body, and then ultimately excreted through sweat, through exhalation, through urine, through feces. Um, molecules of drugs have to cross several barriers in order to enter the body and find their way to the sites of action. And some molecules pass through these barriers relatively easily and quickly, and others do so very slowly. The life cycle of a drug molecule is marked by four stages. In the first stage, they are absorbed. Then they are, in the second stage, distributed within the body. In the third stage, they are metabolized. In the fourth stage, they are excreted. Um, with absorption, what happens is that the drug is administered and um, diffuses through the tissues. Um, and intramuscular injection is an example of that. With distribution, that second stage, the drug travels throughout the body through the bloodstream or cerebral spinal fluid, um, as the case may be. With the third stage, the drug is changed into an inactive form, often by enzymes in the liver. Um, and with the final or fourth stage, the drug is excreted in urine, ultimately by the kidneys, by the action of the kidneys. Now we're going to discuss the ways in which drugs enter the body and um, have their effectiveness or the, the time course of action impacted by the way in which they're taken. Um, I have this illustration um, that I found on the internet, and the source is listed there, um, that describes four modes of drug administration or four ways that um, some drugs are administered. In the next slide, we'll talk about some additional ways, um, all of which are covered in your textbook. The first is injection of a substance directly into the vein, and that's called intravenous administration or intravenous or IV injection. Intramuscular injection is what happens when a drug is um, introduced directly into the muscle. Subcutaneous injection is when the drug is placed in the space directly beneath the skin and the muscle. And with topical administration, often you find a cream is administered, a cream carrying some kind of medicine, um, uh, maybe like a or corticosteroid um, uh, to deal with a rash, can be smeared onto the skin. It's absorbed into the skin, but in any event, it's um, applied directly onto the skin or directly onto a mucous membrane. So the mucous membranes um, in the nose are another example of a type of topical administration, um, which is a little bit different than the aerosol substances that are inhaled uh, for medicinal purposes. Some other typical roots of drug administration include oral, sublingual, intrarectal, and inhalation. On the last slide, I touched briefly on inhalation, um, saying that it's different than the topical administration of a substance, for instance, that binds to the mucous membranes of the sinuses. Instead, what you have with inhalation is a vapor um, is, is um, you know, that carries a, a, a 
drugs or chemical is transmitted directly into the lungs. Um, with oral administration, um, and this is probably the most common form, drugs are taken through the mouth um, and swallowed. And uh, with sublingual administration, the drug is taken by placing it beneath the tongue. With interrectal administration, the substance is put into the anus and um, is absorbed through the membranes uh, surrounding the, the rectum. Based on the mode of administration or the route through which a drug enters the body, you can see that the time course of action from the time its impact is felt um, by the individual um, to the time that it, its, its um, levels or concentrations in the blood are, um, are, are greatly diminished varies. So things that are administered intravenously um, are available for use in the body and the brain uh, relatively immediately as you can see by the black line. Uh, things that are smoked um, are also available relatively immediately, but um, the dosage is almost half of what you could get um, in comparison to uh, things that are um, things that are uh, or administered intravenously in terms of the plasma concentration, uh, in this case of cocaine. Um, things that are, um, you know, administered intranasally, orally, um, all of this uh, is illustrated using the example of cocaine, uh, vary again in terms of how long, how quickly they affect the body and the mind and how long that effect um, persists. So looking at this figure, you should be able to hypothesize and you will probably be able to hypothesize correctly what would be the preferred means for taking a psychoactive substance like cocaine that um, gives the, the experience of euphoria. It shouldn't surprise you that people don't typically take cocaine orally, for instance, based on this graph. Drug effectiveness is measured based on the dose response curve, which is a graph of the magnitude or impact um, of a drug in terms of um, the response you're looking for, a change in behavior or a change in functioning of the body. It's important to note that drugs don't remain in the body indefinitely, as you saw from the previous illustration. Most drugs, all drugs are deactivated by enzymes and eventually excreted primarily by the kidneys, although you can um, lose some drug through other um, processes um, related to respiration and perspiration. Um, the liver plays a really important role in the deactivation of drugs. Um, and some deactivating enzymes are also found in the blood. So even before they make it to the liver, some drugs start to get broken down. The brain also contains enzymes that destroy drugs. You know that glial cells um, play an important role when it comes to deactivating um, even neurotransmitters, even endogenous uh, chemicals that are produced by the body, but especially exogenous chemicals that we take in from outside can themselves be deactivated by glial cell action. When determining the effectiveness of a drug, we also have to look at the costs associated with taking the drug, not only the benefits of the drug. So the effectiveness is that dose response curve. Um, if you're looking at morphine, as this illustration uses, um, the drug is pretty effective um, at high levels, right? Its effectiveness increases with the amount of the drug in terms of its pain relieving properties. But also, as you increase the amount of morphine that's given to alleviate pain, you get into 
a zone of danger whereby increased levels of morphine can depress uh, respiration, stop the breathing of the individual. So you want to be able to ease the suffering um, or the sensation of pain without actually killing a person by administering too much of the drug morphine. So as with any drug, there's a margin of safety that has to be established. And the ratio between the dose that produces the desired effect in 50% of animals, for instance, and the dose that produces the toxic effect in 50% of animals is how we define the margin of safety. Some other things to consider about drugs include tolerance, sensitization, and withdrawal. So tolerance happens when um, there's a decrease in effectiveness of a drug that is administered repeatedly. With um, tolerance, you end up needing more and more of a drug, a higher and higher dose to have the same effect, right? Um, and in this instance, it can lead to someone taking so much that they start to approach the um, the danger zone in terms of the amount of the drug that's necessary to achieve the original effect because you're exceeding that margin of safety. Sensitization is what happens when a drug increases in effectiveness when it's um, administered repeatedly. So it's the opposite of tolerance. Um, and with withdrawal symptoms, what you have is um, the appearance of opposite symptoms to those produced by the drug when the drug is re administered repeatedly and then suddenly um, you stop taking it. So um, with uh, cocaine uh, or other um, chemicals that are commonly abused and um, have a high addictive potential, um, people will take them, they'll build, build tolerance, and then if they stop taking the drug completely, they will experience the drug opposite effects, which are excruciating and life-threatening um, withdrawal symptoms. As part of bringing a drug to market or determining not only um, you know, it, the safety, which we discussed before in terms of effectiveness and the margin of safety, um, but determining um, its potential benefit, uh, it has to be compared in controlled studies um, with placebo or other alternative treatments, right? So placebo, you will recall, is when an inert substance, so like sugar powder, is given instead of the physiologically active drug. And um, it's a phenomenon, it's a commonly known phenomenon whereby, um, particularly in humans, where we um, attribute special properties to, to things that we take, to medicines, um, people will start to feel relief when they take something, anything. And so you can control for the um, automatic effect um, of alleviating symptoms by taking something, anything, by giving half of your clinical trial subjects a placebo, a sugar pill, um, that doesn't have any um, active drug um, and the other half uh, the drug to subtract the effect of just you know taking something and, and experiencing benefits uh, thereof. Um, drug studies also have a way of controlling for experimenter bias which is the tendency for experimenters to control the effects um, based on how they deliver the drug or maybe differently treat um, research subjects in a clinical trial. In order to control for the experimenter effect, we often rely on single blind and double blind cl clinical trials. In the single blind study, subjects don't know whether they're in the experimental group or the control group. Right. And in addition, um, in the double blind study, neither the research subject or 
the clinical person who's administering treatments to determine their efficacy knows which individuals received placebo or drug. This way, um, you will be able to um, really confidently know what is the placebo effect, what is the actual drug effect, without any introduced bias on the part of either subjects or experimenters, and thereby confidently determine the efficacy of a treatment. In this course, we are particularly interested in drugs that affect the mind and behavior. Here is a list of uh, four classes of drugs. I'm sorry, four classes of drugs, four classes of naturally occurring um, neurochemicals that impact um, the mind and subsequently behavior. They include amino acids, um, catecholamines, acetylcholine, acetylcholine and serotonin. Um, what's not listed here is a couple of gases, including nitric oxide, that also have an effect on behavior. All of this would be covered in much more detail in a neuroendocrinology course, but suffice it to say that substances that we take often um, have their effect by their modulation of these already existing endogenous neurochemical pathways. At this point, it's worth reminding that everything that happens in the body that impacts behavior um, through its workings on the mind ultimately does so um, by affecting how neurons communicate with one another. And um, because neurotransmitters have two general effects on postsynaptic membranes, one might expect that there would be two kinds of neurotransmitters, ones that are excitatory and ones that are inhibitory. Um, in the brain, most synaptic communication, most neurons, um, when they're communicating with one another, accomplish this by using two neurotransmitters, one that has excitatory effects and one that has inhibitory effects. The one with excitatory effects is called glutamate, and the one with inhibitory effects is called GABA. And um, their effects on postsynaptic membranes um, lead to depolarization or EPSPs and hyperpolarization or um, IPSPs, which we learned about in an earlier chapter. This illustration um, is similar to one included in your textbook. Um, it has a little bit more detail than the one in your text, um, but I include it here uh, for the purpose of, of highlighting certain things. The things I want you to pay attention to um, in this figure and the um, um, corresponding figure from your text is what is an antagonist, what is an agonist, and um, how do they differently impact um, the function of neurotransmitters, um, uh, the precursors of neurotransmitters, um, enzymes, transporter molecules, um, the release of neurotransmitters from the terminal button, and essentially how drugs work. Um, so just think about drugs' effects um, often unfolding in terms of how they influence basic cellular functions um, in individual neurons. So in this illustration, the blue boxes represent agonist effects of drugs, and the red boxes represent antagonist effects of drugs. Um, Examples of drugs in each category are included in the boxes, along with the neurotransmitter systems that they act on. ACH is acetylcholine, um, ACHE is acetylcholinesterase, 
an enzyme that's used to deactivate acetylcholine, NT is a neurotransmitter, and so on. So an antagonist is a drug that opposes or inhibits the effects of a particular neurotransmitter on the postsynaptic cell. And an agonist is a drug that facilitates the effects of a particular neurotransmitter on the postsynaptic cell. So those are the main objectives, antagonism or agonism. But how you actually um, end up being categorized as an antagonist or an agonist um, can be determined through a, diff to a, through a number of different um, processes. So the first step is the synthesis of neurotransmitters from their precursors. Um, in some cases, the rate of synthesis and the release of a neurotransmitter is increased when a precursor is administered. In these cases, if you give more precursor, then you are effectively agonizing the system. Um, uh, those precursors are serving as an agonist. Um, another step is uh, in the synthesis of neurotransmitters is controlled by enzymes. So if a drug inactivates one of these enzymes, you'll end up with less neurotransmitter being produced. So that drug works as an antagonist. Um, some of the transporter molecules that fill synaptic vesicles are also capable of being blocked by a drug. Uh, molecules of drug bind with a particular site on transporter and inactivate it. Because the synaptic vesicles remain empty, nothing is released when the, ve when the vesicle eventually ruptures against the presynaptic membrane. And so if you have a substance, a medicine that's taken that um, blocks the ability of synaptic vesicles to release their contents, then that drug is serving as an antagonist as well. Some drugs act as antagonists by preventing the release of neurotransmitter from the terminal button. And in this case, they do so by deactivating proteins that cause the synaptic vesicles to actually fuse with the presynaptic membrane and expel their contents into that um, chemical synapse, the synaptic cleft. Other drugs um, have just the opposite effect. They act as agonists by binding with these proteins um, and directly triggering the release of neurotransmitters. So in summary, um, I want you to understand that there are a number of ways a drug becomes classified as an antagonist or an agonist. Basically, an antagonist is a drug that opposes or inhibits the effects of a particular neurotransmitter on the postsynaptic cell. There are a number of different ways this can be accomplished. Um, by its, its negative effect on lots of intermediary steps. An agonist, by contrast, is a drug that facilitates the effects of a particular neurotransmitter on the postsynaptic cell. Again, there are lots of ways this can be accomplished um, by impacting um, precursors, enzymes, transporter molecules, what happens at the terminal button, um, ultimately, if you end up enhancing the effects of a neurotransmitter um, on the postsynaptic cell, then you are an agonist. I now want to turn our attention to what is happening on the cell membrane um, because this can help us understand the agonistic and antagonistic effects of, of uh, chemicals, whether they be endogenous chemicals that are made by the body or exogenous chemicals that are taken in in the form of medicines um, that are prescribed or recreational drugs or um, over-the-counter medicines. So a direct agonist is a drug that binds with and activates a receptor.
a receptor blocker is a drug that binds with the receptor but does not actually activate it. So it's kind of like taking up the spot that a natural ligand, a natural activating substance would do. So by sitting in the spot, the naturally activating substance can't have its effect. So that's what you call a receptor blocker. A direct antagonist is um, the same as a receptor blocker. Um, those are synonyms. Um, direct antagonists and receptor blockers both bind to the receptor without activating uh, that receptor. Non-competitive binding is what happens when a drug um, um, binds to a, a receptor site but doesn't interfere with the binding of um, the pr pr principal ligand um, of that receptor. So the ligand is the thing that's supposed to bind to the receptor. The ligand can be the endogenous chemical or it can be the recreational drug or the prescribed or over-the-counter drug, right? Um, so with non-competitive binding, you get binding of a drug to a site on a receptor in a way that doesn't interfere with the binding site for the principal ligand, the main intended um, uh, target molecule. An indirect antagonist is a drug that attaches to a binding site on the receptor and interferes with the action of the receptor. Um, this does not interfere with the binding site for the principal ligand. An indirect agonist is a drug that attaches to the binding site on, on the receptor and facilitates the actions of the receptor. It um, does not interfere with the binding site for the principal ligand either. At this point in the lecture, I want to remind you of two very useful simulations that are available to you on the Pearson website. One uh, details the process by which an agonist works. Um, and the other details the process by which an antagonist works. Um, the agonist that simulated is nicotine, um, the active ingredient in cigarettes, and Thorazine is the antagonist that's used in the simulation. Um, if you have a moment, go ahead and pause this lecture, watch those simulations, and come back for the follow-up discussion. So now that you have viewed the simulations on the Pearson website. Let's use the example of caffeine to illustrate the basic principles of psychopharmacology. Um, first of all, remember that drugs that we take act as modulators in much the same way that endogenous or naturally occurring chemicals in our body will do. Agonists, remember, increase activity of neurotransmitters, for example, by, by inhibiting their breakdown or reuptake. Um, agonists also increase neurotransmitter activity, sometimes by mimicking those neurotransmitters, binding to their intended receptor targets, and stimulating the same actions. Nicotine, morphine, and tranquilizers are examples of agonists that were discussed in the Pearson simulations. Antagonists decrease the activity of neurotransmitters or sometimes block their receptors by um, sitting in the receptors without actually stimulating them and Botox, Thorazine, and caffeine are examples of antagonists. Caffeine is very interesting because it's a widely used um, psychotropic drug that is especially commonly used by um, college students and shift workers. Um, and it works, interestingly, by antagonizing the receptors for adenosine. So normally, adenosine is a 
uh, molecule that slowly accumulates over the course of the day. So from the time that you wake up in the morning until the time that you go to bed at night, adenosine is accumulating. And with its an increase, we feel more and more sleepy as neuronal signaling is actually slowed with the accumulation of adenosine. While you're asleep, adenosine levels drop off, leaving you feeling more rested in the morning. Caffeine looks like adenosine, but it doesn't have the same effects. So when we consume it, it sits in the adenosine receptors, the intended target of adenosine, without actually causing the normal neuronal signaling um, depressive effects. And so by taking caffeine, we're able to wake up when we're unrested or maintain a level of alertness that's high for longer periods of the day. So caffeine is stimulating, but not without some side effects, as you probably know from personal experience. I certainly know that I do. Um, one of these is that it increases the levels of the stress hormone adrenaline, which enables us to fight or flight, basically shifting us into sympathetic mode. Um, the side effect being a racing heart, right? Um, palpitation. So too much caffeine can make you feel really anxious. Um, and, you know, uh, that is certainly unpleasant and certainly compromises your ability to focus or function at a high cognitive level. Caffeine also increases the levels of dopamine and anything that increases dopamine, which is that feel good chemical, has the potential for long term abuse. That's because dopamine contributes to its rewarding properties. And um, we know not only is taking caffeine um, rewarding, but we can tell that um, the addiction potential is high because the more caffeine you drink, the more the brain produces adenosine receptors to combat the chronic use of caffeine so that the real adenosine can do its job. That drives up tolerance. So you need more caffeine to have the same effects. So when you're in middle school, and you drink a Red Bull, one is enough. But by the time you're a college senior, you may need five in order to have the same effects um, in terms of the level of alertness you get from drinking Red Bull because of the tolerance that you develop for the, the caffeine, the active substance. And so as we're taking more of and more of the drug and developing tolerance, um, we're also um, reinforcing the rewarding properties of the drug by by increasing the levels of dopamine that are released um, uh, in consequence to its um, ingestion. And um, so while a habitual coffee drinker may need more and more to, to feel alert, um, one of the things that's underscored by this lecture is that there's a margin of safety for every substance, right? And for caffeine, um, we build tolerance, but we certainly can't exceed a certain threshold before we start to develop some adverse effects, including not only symptoms of anxiety or a racing heart, but mania and hallucinations are what people experience with excessively high levels of caffeine. And um, there, there's evidence that um, uh, 14,000 milligrams is probably the lethal dose for caffeine. I don't think any of us would ever get there because you have to take that amount in one sitting um, and it's really hard to drink that much liquid. Of course, you can get caffeine in, in um, tablet form. Don't do that. Um, so 70 cups of coffee that contain about 150 milligrams per cup 
is what you would need to get to a lethal dose of caffeine. So everything in moderation, right, I think is the conclusion to be drawn from this uh, part one of your lecture on psychopharmacology.